Tonight's Wisaka Puja. Wisaka is the name of the month. Puja means to pay homage. We're not paying homage to the month, we're paying homage to events that happened this month. The tradition has it that the Buddha was born on the full moon night of this month. And then 35 years later, he gained awakening on the full moon night of this month. And then 45 years after that, he entered Trola Nibbana again on the full moon night in this month. So we commemorate these events every year by paying homage to the Buddha, the homage to his awakening, homage to the fact that he was able to find a path to the end of suffering and teach it to others. Gain total release from birth, aging, illness, and death. Those are momentous events. The tradition has it that the, the earth quaked on each one of them. Because of the kind of events that really do shape and define the world in which we live. If we lived in a world where no one had found a way to put an end to suffering, it would be a very different world from what it is. But the Buddha established that possibility, and in so doing, he changed the world. These are the kind of events that shape our lives, because they give us a new sense of what's possible. So we pay homage. What we did just now is called a Misa Bucha, which you pay homage with material things. Candles, flowers, incense. But as the Buddha said, the best way to pay homage was through the practice. Bhattibhat Bucha. Which you practice the Dharma in line with the Dharma. In other words, you practice for the sake of dispassion. There was one time when a group of monks were going to a far distant land. They paid their respects to the Buddha. And he said, have you paid your respects to Sariputta? They hadn't. And so he sent them to see Sariputta. And Sariputta asked them, the people in that land are intelligent. They'll ask you, what does your teacher teach, and how would you answer them? The monks took advantage of the fact that they were with Sariputta, who was the Buddhist student who was known to have the most discerning, most discernment. He said, tell them that your teacher teaches dispassion, the ending of passion. And then he said, because they're intelligent, they'll want to know dispassion for what? which shows a big difference between people back then and people now. Nowadays, if you told someone, our teacher teaches dispassion, they would probably not pay any, not ask any further questions. But as Sariputta said, those people are intelligent, they want to know dispassion for what? Dispassion for the five aggregates. Why? What advantage is there in dispassion for these things? Because if you cling to these things, then when they change, there's going to be sorrow. But if you have dispassion for them, then no matter how much they change, there will be no sorrow. And then he went on to say, if in developing skillful qualities people did not gain true happiness, the Buddha wouldn't have recommended it. But it's because we do gain true happiness through developing skillful qualities. That's why he taught these things. So this is how we begin our practice of the Dharma in line with the Dharma, by trying to develop skillful qualities in mind. Like when you're meditating right now, you focus on the breath. That's called directed thought. And then you seek and you stay with the breath for long periods of time, because you're trying to develop concentration. As the Buddha once said, that's the heart of the path all the other elements that he awakened to in the path, serve as its requisites, as its supports. But the concentration itself is getting the mind focused on one thing. 
and then allowing that one object to fill your awareness. So with the breath, you notice when it's coming in, when it's going out, you stay with it right here, right now. And then you think of the breath energy filling the whole body, comfortable breath energy. Wherever there's a sense of ease, you let it go through the torso, the arms, the legs, the head. So the mind can be well established with a sense of well-being. And as long as it still hasn't gotten rid of its passion, have some passion for the path. That's why the Buddha has puts concentration there at the center, because it gives you a sense of well-being. It's food for the mind. So as you start looking at the things that would pull you away from concentration, you begin to realize they begin to lose a lot of their appeal. You look at the things that you used to feel passionate about, and you see that it's very empty. A lot of times it accomplishes nothing, and sometimes worse. In other words, it accomplishes nothing, but it actually takes away. Because there's so many things that we're passionate for that we will do all kinds of things to get without thinking about right or wrong, skillful or unskillful, which means we'll probably do things that are wrong and things that are unskillful. And that becomes our karma. That shapes the world in which we're going to live. So you can shape the mind so it's not quite so hungry for things outside. And it can gain a sense of detachment. You're putting yourself in a better position to do what is wise, to do what is skillful, to do what is really beneficial for you and the people around you. So you develop dispassion for the things that are outside of the path. Maintain your passion for the path. That's the last type of passion you're going to let go of. It's in this way that you pay true homage to the Buddha. Because you think about all that he went through in order to find this path, the type of person he had to be, resolute, ardent, heedful. As he said, the secret to his awakening was not resting content with the skillful qualities, to say nothing of unskillful qualities. He kept looking for what was better. And even in his skillful qualities, he looked for where there were still drawbacks. So that his skill became more and more refined. That was the type of person it took in order to find this path, and then to be able to formulate it in words so he could teach it to other people. After he gained his awakening, he surveyed the world. He looked at the Dharma that he had won. and thought of all that he had been through. And he began to wonder, would it be worthwhile to teach this? Would there be people who would appreciate it? Would there be people who benefited? And he was inclined not to teach. Because after all, when he had gained awakening, he really owed nothing to anybody anymore. The story goes that there was a Brahma who saw what was going on in the Buddha's mind. was was concerned. He said, we're lost. The world won't have a Buddha. The world won't know about the Buddha's teachings. So he came down and invited the Buddha to teach. He said, there are those with little dust in their eyes. They will see and they will appreciate and they will benefit. So the Buddha looked further and he said, yes, that was true. So he decided to teach. So his teaching was totally a gift. He didn't have to teach. We somehow think that because he'd aimed at becoming a teaching Buddha, that once he'd gained awakening that he was compelled to teach. But the fact of awakening was so radical, that meant that he had no debts to anybody at all. So the fact that we have this teaching is a pure gift on his part. And so we should receive it as a gift, with a sense of gratitude. So as we practice, we practice not only 
taking the Dharma in line with the Dharma for the sake of dispassion, but also with a very strong sense of gratitude. That's because of the Buddha that we live in a world where the path to the end of suffering has been found. It's still being taught. It's still open. And we think of all the generations that it has gone through and the times when people said, oh, the time has passed. There's nobody anymore who can not even, don't to say nothing of gaining awakening. There's nobody who can even attain right concentration, which means there have been people who have had to rediscover the path. Taking the cue from the fact that the Buddha did teach these things, and as he said, the Dhamma is timeless. So they took his teachings and took them seriously. So we think of this path as tends to get overgrown with weeds every now and then. But then there are people who come along and cut away the weeds to make it easier for us to practice. We think about the Ajans in Thailand. Without them, where would we be? Totally clueless. So we think of the Buddha as our ultimate admirable friend and all the other admirable friends who have kept this teaching alive. And here's our opportunity. We live in this world where the end of suffering has been taught, the path to the end of suffering has been taught. As the Buddha said, there will come a time when the Dharma is forgotten. This is a, it had, there have been Buddhas before him. <clears throat> Their teachings were forgotten. And it took the Buddha many, many lifetimes, a lot of effort, a lot of dedication to find the path again. So here's the opportunity. Don't let it slip from your grasp. Take advantage of it while it's here. And that way you're paying homage to the Buddha and you're benefiting at the same time. You can think about it. He, he went through all that effort to find this path, to put an end to suffering. And as he said, the appropriate way to show homage, to show appreciation, is to practice the Dharma in line with the Dharma. He didn't benefit from the fact that people were doing this. And yet that's the kind of homage he wanted, which shows what a magnanimous heart he had. And so we, let, we should let his teaching expand our hearts as well. He found a path that benefited him and would benefit others. And so we should make sure that our practice benefits us and the people around us too. And that way we help keep this trauma alive in the world. <clears throat>